you know um, a couple of announcements uh, first thing is about uh, the test you know we need to take one test uh, one more test and that test will be on day after tomorrow which is the friday okay so all of you please note this that on friday we have the last test okay um, so friday means uh, today is 7th 8th 9th 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 of um, uh, april will be the uh, will be the test okay and um, so uh, we still uh, have to uh, you know do the project evaluation for which we do not have uh, too much of time um, so wednesday actually we are supposed to do the project evaluation um, so uh, so in case actually students in case we run out of time which is quite likely um, uh, so wednesday we have class from 11 to 12 uh, can you uh, can most of you continue for the next one hour so 12 to 1 Is no, there sir, any... uh, I have another class there, uh, after that. Hmm? Sir, I have another class 12 to 1. Yes, uh, sir, same. You have a class from 12 to 1. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think I don't think that within one hour we can complete. What about on Friday? Friday, uh, what is the situation? So, so we have regular classes from eight to nine. So what about nine to ten? Sir, I have a class at nine to ten too. At what time? So nine to ten, sir. After the eight to nine class. How many of you have class from nine to ten? Uh, I do have. I too have. I Sir, I too have a class. Sir, I too. Okay. So, so maybe afternoon, if we can arrange. Yeah. So what you have to do is you have to see these uh, project evaluations will be done uh, along with your TA, right? Respective TA. In case you miss out your presentation within the schedule, right? You have to schedule it separately with your TA. OK, so uh, I am uh, so there are two possibilities now, uh, you know, uh, I was planning to have the test on Friday. And uh, the project evaluation on Wednesday, but I think I can swap it if you will. Right. So in other words, uh, we can have the project evaluation on Friday. And the test uh, we can have on Wednesday. Is that going to be better for you? No, sir. Can you have the project evaluation no, on Wednesday itself? We have to prepare the presentation and all in two days. That would be difficult. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I understand. But at the same time, you know, you, you should have been already prepared, right? So, you know, right? We are coming towards the end of the semester. OK, but uh, still, you know, I can take your, um, you know, wish. And uh, but in that case, you will have to work it out with your TA and you will need to schedule a separate hour for it you know if you have to go beyond the schedule right uh, so uh, you know like before uh, you know you will be breaking out in different sessions with the ta and uh, you know you need to uh, if you miss your presentation within the schedule um, so what i would request all the tas is basically you know those who have a class afterwards you can schedule their presentations first and after that, you can give them priority. And after that, the ones who do not have a class, you can schedule theirs, right? But in case students, in case your TA is not able to schedule your presentation within the scheduled hours of the class, then you need to, you know, schedule it on the same day. It has to be on the same day. You know, we cannot give an unfair advantage to some of the students, right? So it has to be on Wednesday itself. Some other time, you know, you need to schedule it. OK, so but I leave it to you. I, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, so you can work it out with your respective TAs. OK, so we are having the test day after tomorrow. And we are having the project evaluations on the last day of the class, which is the Wednesday. I think it is the 14th, right? Yeah, so it is the 14th of April. OK, so please note and Paula, please also uh, put this notice up 
on uh, Moodle or uh, on Meet. OK. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so um, yeah, uh, now we have uh, two hours in between. Uh, today, you know, a uh, uh, little bit uh, we can cover and we have one more hour tomorrow. OK, so I think, you know, uh, uh, we can touch upon some of the things that I had planned uh, may not be in too much of detail as I would have otherwise liked to have. Uh, but given the uh, little, uh, very little time that we have, at least what I can do is I can expose you to some of the other issues in cloud computing. OK, so. Um, yeah, before before I go ahead, um, uh, you know, uh, so your uh, marks uh, have been posted. Um, uh, yeah, your marks have been posted on um, uh, teams, uh, maybe on Moodle also. Uh, so please contact the TA if uh, you have any difficulty in viewing the marks. And um, this is one thing. Uh, second thing is all the uh, materials, um, you know, study materials, uh, you know, uh, particularly the PPTs, not all the study materials, but the PPTs basically, what, whatever has been covered, uh, you know, if it has not already been uploaded by the TA uh, so far, uh, you know, so it will be done uh, today itself. So please contact the TA. Please remind him. Uh, please remind Pollock uh, to upload the slides if it has not been uploaded uh, yet. OK, and uh, today whatever we are going to cover will also be uploaded accordingly by the end of uh, the day today. Uh, so TAs, please note, uh, please upload the slides immediately after the class. OK, so without losing any further time, uh, I would like to get started. Uh, I would start with uh, uh, yeah, so let me just share my screen. Yeah. Uh, I hope that all of you are able to see my screen. OK. So there is. Um, you know, so uh, there is something called cloud, uh, fog computing. Everybody is able to see my screen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good. So there is something called fog computing. Fog computing basically came as a necessity out of some of the limitations that were there with the use of cloud computing, right? I think most of you must have heard about fog computing technology because it is the state of the art. It is something that is very uh, well known, uh, not only in the research community, but also in many of the implementations uh, globally. So fog computing particularly uh, became uh, very popular uh, in the community, uh, in, the, uh, in the community working with IoT systems, Internet of Things, which we covered uh, in some of the previous lectures. And um, so basically in IoT, um, you know, so what you have is, um, you know, continuous streaming of data, right? That is something that you have seen. Um, so uh, the, the usual way uh, to integrate with cloud is basically that you will be streaming all the data to the cloud. Now the problem with cloud is that most of these data, uh, sorry, most of these cloud um, servers, uh, these are uh, located distance apart, right? So these could be, you know, you, you might be uh, storing some data uh, uh, on the cloud with, where the physical server may be actually located in uh, some other country, right? And um, so there are several concerns actually when we talk about this kind of a system. Uh, there are several concerns, right, with this kind of architecture. So we'll look into what are those different concerns and how fog computing basically uh, can resolve some of these different issues. So uh, fog computing, as I was telling you, uh, you know, basically deals with how uh, particularly how uh, IoT, IoT devices, you know, how how they can, how the data that, that, that are produced from these IoT devices, how they can alternatively or maybe in collaboration jointly with uh, cloud technology, how these data could be processed in a better way compared to sending all the data to the cloud, right? So this is what basically, uh, you know, fog computing talks about. 
so um, you know so when we talk about uh, users right so let us say the iot devices uh, just as an example right it doesn't have to be iot but just as an example so let us say these iot devices are used by different users so the, the users basically have the the you know so users basically are the ones who are interacting with the physical sensors with the iot devices and users are the ones who produce the data who also will be consuming the data that are basically produced eventually right so this data will have to be uh, processed this data will have to be stored so traditionally what is done is that the data are sent uh, to the remote cloud right so um, uh, so so the data are sent and also the applications that are running uh, uh, they are typically run uh, uh, in these remote servers uh, which are located uh, distance apart so um, so uh, so basically uh, you know uh, the advantage of using cloud is that you really do not need to uh, bother about uh, you know the procurement of the infrastructure you do not need to install a software you do not really need to uh, you know uh, install any uh, development platform for development uh, and so on so th these are the things that you already know um, uh, so so you have some kind of uh, access to virtualized service offerings and uh, that becomes uh, basically you know uh, that basically reduces the overall capital expenditure and the overheads in terms of the maintenance of the infrastructure and the software so these are the these are these are the different ad advantages of cloud which you are already exposed to several in several lectures right um, so uh, so this uh, saas pass and uh, ias infrastructure as a service uh, these basically you know offer you software services platform services infrastructure services and we have seen several uh, examples of each of these different uh, you know compute computing services uh, that uh, are offered commercially uh, so, uh, so, so in a typical uh, environment, when you are using uh, cloud, what happens is that uh, typically, you know, you can conceptualize the entire architecture into three layers. Um, at the very top, you have the cloud layer, as you can see in this particular figure, and at the very bottom, what you have are basically the users and their corresponding IoT devices. So these IoT devices, or it does, again, as I said, I'm just taking IoT as an example. It doesn't have to be uh, the uh, IoT devices. I mean, so the users may be producers of data through different other devices as well. So anyway, so these data that are produced by the users, these will have to be sent through some, uh, you know, some middleware, some middle uh, network, intermediate network, uh, con comprising. Uh, different switches uh, comprising different uh, you know other networking uh, infrastructure like base stations etc etc so so through multiple hops uh, in this middle tier uh, the networking device layer uh, through multiple hops as you can see these red colored uh, series of arrows uh, they take the data from the producers of the data uh, to the cloud right uh, so this is what you see in this particular figure um, now uh, the the data are basically uh, processed at the cloud and the results are fed back to the user uh, as shown through the dashed green arrow in this figure so this is typically what happens in a typical uh, cloud based scenario now uh, now what happens is that uh, you know so there is a continuous uh, flow of data in terms of sending of the data receiving of the information after processing the data and so on uh, through this intermediate layer uh, now, uh, you know, that basically, you know, the, the problem is that, uh, you know, uh, whenever you are sending everything to the cloud and particularly if uh, the cloud infrastructure are physically uh, distantly located, then, uh, you know, you, you incur a lot of latency. That means that the units of data that are sent from the user, they pass through multiple hops, hops before reaching to the cloud and that basically delays everything delays uh, uh, you know the response that uh, the user is going to get corresponding to the data that is produced so um, so so the the point is that can we do better can we do better so for uh, that basically fog computing was proposed uh, through one of the high, white papers by cisco uh, so cisco is basically uh, the originator of this fog concept uh, fog is basically an acronym uh, so please find it out what is the full form of uh, uh, this acronym it is an acronym 
uh, it is not basically uh, the fog that you encounter in the in the in the nature right it is not that fog right it's just an acronym so please you know it's just a homework for you to check what is the full form of fog so anyway um, so this fog layer basically uh, uh, you know what it does is instead of sending all the data to the cloud uh, you know so which incurs uh, additional uh, delay additional latency what it will do is in the fog layer which is closer to the actual originators of the data that means the users the data are going to be processed to some extent uh, in this intermediate layer which is called the fog layer and the, in the fog layer basically you have all these net you know uh, all these infrastructure like switches and um, gateways etc you know, so all these network infrastructure are there and there are some uh, the, some of these network infrastructure are also um, they have certain computational capabilities right uh, so what happens is that instead of sending all the data through them to the cloud you uh, the, the fog devices which are part of this fog layer these fog devices can do certain processing but these fog devices are not too much well equipped like the like the cloud right so these are not as much um, uh, you know capable of uh, high-end computation uh, like the servers in the cloud right so you have these um, moderately uh, uh, you know efficient uh, uh, you know computer computing uh, capabilities in these different devices in the fog layer right so uh, so what this fog layer will do is it will first discriminate between the different packets that it receives whether some of these packets need to be and can be processed at the fog layer itself in the different devices comprising this fog layer so those data which those packets which can be processed um, you know in this layer will be done and the rest of the data will be sent uh, to the cloud particularly you know think about uh, let us say you know uh, real time streaming of uh, some data right so streams of data which will have to be processed in real time uh, some of these could if it is possible some of these would be would be processed uh, at the fog uh, layer at the devices in the fog layer and the rest of the data which cannot be and which can wait uh, for longer duration of time for further processing these would be sent to the cloud right so uh, so this is basically the whole idea of introducing this fog layer uh, now there is another uh, technology uh, which uh, is also evolving uh, and has become very popular recently uh, it is called the edge computing right so uh, fog computing basically talks about uh, the computing um, you know uh, uh, computing at this uh, in these different devices in the fog layer but edge computing basically talks about that these devices uh, over here uh, either in these devices or very close to them like maybe in the intermediate gateway or something like that which are very close to these devices at the edge itself can you do some of this processing right now the the main problem is that closer you come to this edge closer you come to the source of this data uh, these devices basically have very limited capability of further processing right so fog fog uh, the devices in the fog layer these are more capable compared to the devices in the edge layer and the different definitely the devices in the cloud uh, that means the servers high end servers etc these have far better processing capability compared to the those compared to those in the fog layer now the question is that which data are you going to uh, process at the edge and which data are you going to send to the fog which data you are going to send to the cloud right so there are so many different algorithms which talk about how when and where the data are going to be processed right so uh, typically it's a integration it's a combination of all of these different technologies it's uh, not that only cloud is used it's not that only fog and cloud are used typically in a modern implementation particularly implementation of uh, iot based systems uh, what we do is we use all these three fog cloud and edge all of these three computing technologies we use to uh, to offer uh, improved performance of processing of the data okay any questions so far okay so if not let us proceed further because there is a lot to cover today so the difference between uh, fog and uh, edge computing uh, so both of them they bring the data and the intelligence to the edge of the network right so edge of the network means as much close as possible to the source devices which are producing the data so both fog 
and age basically talk about how you can process some of the data as much close, close, close as possible to the sources or the producers of the data. Now, what is this intelligence? So uh, earlier people used to talk about fog intelligence, but nowadays people are talking about age intelligence. Age intelligence at present is a very uh, hot uh, you know, area of research uh, in these domains. So age intelligence basically talks about using uh, or implementing artificial intelligence, particularly you know, machine learning algorithms, uh, you know, using them at the age layer. Now the problem is that all of these machine learning algorithms, if you have particularly taken a course in machine learning, you know that whether you are talking about classification, whether you are talking about uh, any kind of training or anything, right? So all of these uh, machine learning, um, you know, uh, algorithms, including simple ones like clustering, etc. These are computationally intensive. Now, these age devices, they have very little, uh, you know, computing power. So uh, the the point is that uh, people who work in these domains, what they are trying to do is that they are trying to make these, um, you know, uh, uh, these AI algorithms lightweight for use uh, in the devices comprising the age layer, right? So, uh, so basically, this is the whole uh, idea of research in the in the domain of age intelligence. So, uh, in our research group, basically in Swan Lab, we do a lot of research. We used to do a lot of research uh, on uh, you know IoT cloud interfacing, etc. Then, uh, for about five to six years, we did a lot of work on fog computing. Uh, at present, actually, our focus is on age computing, not just age computing, the most difficult one, which is called the age intelligence. You know, so we do a lot of our work on age intelligence. We are basically, you know, we have a uh, lot of footprint. Uh, we are working um, in the manufacturing sector. We are working in the healthcare sector. We are working in the agricultural sector. Uh, so basically, you know, what happens is uh, in some of these sectors, like, for example, manufacturing, right? You have machines, you have high-end robotic enabled machines which basically uh, produce a lot of data. Now, if you are going to send all this data to the cloud, uh, then, uh, you know, so these are not going to be very much useful in uh, in this kind of uh, real-time environments, right? So in these kind of situations, actually, we are trying to come up with age-based solutions which are going to do some of this processing right uh, uh, at the source uh, from where the data are produced, right? Um, so age computing is uh, limited to uh, em embedded systems and close to the data sources. Uh, age computing does not transmit data to the network. Uh, you know, so basically most of the uh, computing uh, uh, or the processing of the data are done at the age devices themselves. And, and uh, the results uh, in that case, because you know you are cutting down on the latency, uh, because you are doing most of the processing at the age itself, the results could be provided. Uh, to the intended recipients of this information, uh, for example, the users in real time. So fog computing basically operates uh, on the local area network level uh, and uh, for uh, for different uh, generalized applications. So fog computing basically provides results in uh, real time or uh, in near real time uh, kind of performance environment. So, uh, you know, so I told you that Cisco basically came up with their white paper, uh, which is referenced below on this slide, um, you know, so which talks about uh, this fog computing. So um, in the fog, uh, basically, you know, as per the Cisco document, uh, this white paper, uh, fog basically extends the cloud uh, to be closer to the things that produce and act on the IoT data, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, so that the things that are produce, producers of the data, uh, you know, they are the ones who are also going to act on the data. So these devices called the fog nodes could be deployed anywhere within a network uh, on a factory floor, on top of a power pole, uh, alongside a railway track, in a vehicle or on an oil rig. Any device with computing storage and network connectivity can be a fog device. So some level of computing should be there. So some level of computing capability should be there. The more computing capability is there, the easier it becomes uh, uh, to be uh, to for it to be used as a fog node for doing some of the processing. So examples uh, include basically industrial controllers, switches, routers, embedded servers, and video surveillance cameras. So this is basically what I have taken, what I have lifted from this Cisco white paper. So what I would encourage you to do is after you get the get the copy of the slide, so please uh, click on this particular link and go through this white paper from Cisco. 
Um, so this is uh, typically, you know, what happens uh, uh, in a, uh, you know, in a, um, uh, this kind of uh, fog cloud uh, kind of environment. You have these user devices. These user devices basically, you know, uh, so they, they, they are the ones who uh, uh, basically produce a lot of data, right? So if there are non time sensitive data, this data could be sent to the cloud. Uh, and uh, so uh, because these are not time sensitive, you do not really need to uh, process the data uh, quickly, right? So, uh, you know, so uh, the non time sensitive data will be sent to the cloud for historical analysis and storage. And if the data uh, are otherwise, that means time sensitive, then the data are going to be sent to the nearest fog nodes uh, like this, right? So these are going to be offloaded. Uh, the data are going to be offloaded to the nearest fog nodes. The nearest fog nodes, they are going to process the data and the results are going to be fed back to these user devices for further interpretation and action. So, um, so, if, so there, you know, typically, you know, there, there are a cluster of different fog nodes. These fog nodes, they are basically positioned uh, close to the uh, user devices as much close as possible, but not uh, too close, like in the case of the edge computing devices. Uh, so uh, these fog devices, basically, uh, because there are a cluster of different fog devices, there are uh, many fog devices. So these fog devices, they could also balance their loads, uh, you know, uh, by transferring some of these data to the nearby uh, other fog nodes. Uh, and that basically, you know, helps to uh, overall achieve uh, a balanced, um, you know, kind of um, uh, processing of uh, the data, right? And finally, what happens is uh, that whether it is a single fog node or whether it is a collaboration of different fog nodes through a load balanced approach, uh, so this processing is done and the results are basically sent to the source devices, the user devices. Right. And uh, the rest of the data, which again, you know, can wait, uh, you know, the, uh, so these are basically the rest of the data and the rest of the, um, you know, uh, parts of the data uh, are going to be processed and these are going to be sent uh, to the uh, to the cloud for historical analysis and storage. Right. So either way, whether it is the non science sensitive data or whether it is the time sensitive data. So some of these data are going to be sent to the cloud, uh, which can wait the process for which the processing can wait. These data are sent to the cloud for further uh, analysis and, uh, you know, uh, non real time analysis and historical storage. So the advantage is that uh, you can cut down on the latency uh, using fog computing. You can conserve bandwidth. Uh, you can have enhanced security and why enhanced security that I will tell you shortly. Then reliability in operations are also going to be increased because you know you are not sending all the data all the way through multi hop path to the cloud. So because you are cutting down on these so the reliability of the operations are also going to be increased uh, and the data are going to be uh, specially aware, right? So not everything is going to be uh, sent centralized to the cloud but these are going to be distributed all across. So as a result, uh, you know, there is going to be the, uh, you know, special distribution of the data. Uh, then in terms of uh, latency, uh, basically, you know, you, you can reduce uh, the latency, uh, particularly, um, you know, this is important for time sensitive operations, time sensitive applications. Uh, for example, video data, video feeds, uh, for surveillance, right? Video feeds for surveillance. They are actually you need to process uh, the data as quickly as possible, right? Otherwise, the surveillance will have got no meaning. Uh, so that is the reason uh, actually, uh, you know, so for time sensitive operations, you have to take advantage of fog and fog intelligence. Um, so uh, so basically it cuts down on uh, the, uh, the time, particularly with respect to uh, hopping of the data through multiple uh, multiple devices that reduces the transmission time and um, you know so overall there is a trade off between the execution speed of cloud uh, and the fog and this has to be taken care of because 
cloud it's not that you know fog has all advantages cloud is very powerful it's very robust so sending all the data to the cloud is actually uh, very good but at the same time if you are sending all the data to the cloud particularly for time sensitive applications you know you are going to lose on the performance because you know uh, things are going to be very slow um, and uh, so for that actually fog can help particularly for the time sensitive data the execution of time sensitive time sensitive data fog can help but at the same time fog has its own processing limitations processing and storage limitations so basically you know what you need to do is some kind of a discrimination like the like the one that i was telling you earlier uh, that you need to discriminate between the streams of the packets that are coming which data will have to be processed quickly which ones can uh, wait for longer durations of time so based on that you know you can get uh, differentiated uh, differential uh, services uh, for uh, the uh, the different types of data that are produced um, so uh, i am not going to go through them uh, in detail uh, too much but i think this is something that you can understand that uh, you know so through fog uh, introduction of a fog uh, computing platform you know you are going to conserve uh, the bandwidth uh, because uh, you know iot devices as such are uh, continuously uh, they produce huge amount of data and it is not practical to send all these streams all these huge amount of data sending everything to the cloud is not going to be practical and particularly for this time sensitive applications it is not practical so uh, and also there is another thing that not all applications will need uh, this high end kind of processing at the cloud right um, so uh, so that, that is the reason actually some of these are going to be postponed uh, postponed and some of these services uh, they they are going to be performed at the fog layer itself and the rest are going to be sent to the cloud for further processing uh, enhanced security um, you know you see that when you are talking about uh, cloud computing in cloud computing basically from the source uh, device uh, to the cloud the data basically travels through multiple networks to reach the cloud and i think that is something that i that doesn't need further explanation i think it is quite obvious but based on the picture that i had shown you that from the source device to the cloud uh, the data basically travels through multiple networks uh, so um, uh, 12 o'clock 12 o'clock i'm in a class i'm in a class 12 o'clock uh, so fog basically allows local processing and the data uh, do not need to travel far uh, it remains uh, closer to the data generating uh, sensor modules and reduces the possibility of attacks uh, uh, so basically you know that way you have increased security when you are uh, you know when you are introducing fog computing uh, but uh, it is limited to the local network and as i said earlier you know fog uh, in terms of processing and storage it is not as much comparable uh, to that of the cloud not uh, as much means like it is uh, you know very less the processing capability and the storage capabilities are extremely less much less compared to those that are offered by the cloud so you need to do some kind of uh, a pre-processing to uh, to find out which data you are going to uh, process uh, at the fog and which uh, data you are going to send to the cloud so this is pictorially depicted over here uh, here as you can see the data are traveling to uh, long distances like this uh, if you are talking about cloud right so um, so i think uh, this is this is pretty self explanatory i do not need to explain it further but when you are talking about fog computing uh, you know due to the infrastructure that are uh, uh, you know that are located close to the sources uh, so the data are localized to the the fog computing devices only right uh, so there are different other advantages of the use of fog computing uh, you know fog computing gives you reliable operations uh, and the data are specially aware and uh, you get uh, optimized uh, movement of the data you do not need to send all the data uh, to the cloud so you get optimized movement of the data and uh, so you know it also fog computing basically also has a lot of other different advantages for example reduced load from the cloud and support for mobility Mo support for mobility means like you know if you have large number of different mobile devices then a fog architecture is going to be uh, better performing with respect to certain criteria compared to the cloud based architecture so uh, in terms of different applications applications requiring any kind of real time uh, you know uh, processing uh, real time analysis like real time health analysis in healthcare or intelligent uh, power efficient uh, systems real time real monitoring pipeline optimization uh, these are basically 
uh, you know, uh, the ones where fog computing uh, can be advantageous. So fog computing will give uh, real time monitoring, reduced network latency, close proximity uh, of uh, processing of the data and reduced operational cost. And there are a few other different applications compared to the use of cloud computing for processing. So there are so many different other challenges as well. These fog devices, as I said, these are, uh, you know, these do not have too much of uh, capability in terms of, um, you know, processing in terms of storage. And also these are very small sized, much smaller sized compared to the devices that you have in cloud. So because these are, uh, you know, and many times these are actually battery powered also, right? So you have power consumption challenges. Consequently, you have data security challenges. You have reliability challenges. You have challenges of fault tolerance, you know, ensuring fault tolerance, real time analysis and architectures so like this. Actually, there are so many different challenges. So very quickly, I will touch upon another thing where we do a lot of research, which is called the 5G technology, 5G and beyond 5G. Uh, so 6G, 7G, etc. So in our group in the Swan Lab, we do some research on uh, 5G technology and beyond 5G. Uh, so uh, you know the 5G technology has uh, different features and advantages. For example, use of something called MM wave, millimeter wave. I think you must have heard about millimeter wave uh, communication. Uh, so millimeter wave, uh, there is a concept of small cells, um, then uh, massive MIMO. Uh, beam forming and full duplex. These are some of the attractive, uh, you know, uh, features uh, of 5G technology. So I'm not going to again go through all of these. So basically, you know that um, basically when the wavelength decreases, uh, sorry, so rather the when the frequency increases, the wavelength decreases, right? Uh, so basically, in milli millimeter wave, you have you are talking about wavelengths which are very narrow, and this technology is useful for uh, different practical applications. Uh, however, the range is limited uh, to uh, few kilometers only. Uh, so small cells, the use of small cell technology in 5G basically gives you reliable coverage, uh, more co coverage, better coverage because you know the cell sizes are small. So you have reliable coverage, you have spectral efficiency, improved capacity, uh, improved overall performance and high speed. Then uh, you must have heard about uh, MIMO and massive MIMO technologies. Multiple input, multiple output is the full form of MIMO. So massive MIMO basically talks about increasing the number of, uh, you know, supporting the increased number of devices uh, or uh, supporting the increased number of users, which is very common uh, nowadays. So, um, you know, so uh, through, uh, you know, the use of this uh, massive MIMO technology, um, you know, uh, diverse types of services could be offered. Uh, and there can be efficient uh, task scheduling and processing of the data uh, near to the uh, the sources of this data, right? So these are some of these different advantages of uh, massive MIMO technology. Beam forming is another technology which is based on antennas. So there is directional, uh, you know, signal processing, signal transmission in beam forming, and uh, so basically, you know, that gives you faster communication, improved communication, and uh, it is also going to avoid a blockage due to buildings or trees. Uh, full duplex is a very, uh, you know, emerging uh, kind of, uh, commun uh, you know, communication um, area of research. Um, so basically, you know, in full duplex, people people are talking about uh, two-way communication through the same channel, right? To both way, full duplex. Full duplex means that both way the communication is going to take place. And uh, that basically is advantageous because if you are having full duplex, you can uh, have improved uh, network performance. You can have, uh, you know, much reduced latency and you can have increased uh, capacity of uh, the network because, you know, you are doing both the sending and the re uh, receiving. I mean, so not the sending and the receiving, bo both way communication actually you are doing uh, at the same time. So you have increased capacity and consequently you have improved uh, spectral efficiency. To the introduction of 5G. So, uh, as a conclusion, uh, as you can see uh, that um, you know, so uh, so basically, uh, this technology, uh, 5G and fog and all of these, uh, these are uh, these can help in offering advanced levels of services by reducing the load from the cloud uh, by bringing processing closer to the sensors uh, uh, and the users and increasing security. And there are a few other. Uh, advantages like real time analysis and pro provisioning. So that's all. Any question?
OK, so um, the next one that I'm going to start quickly is. Uh, this are you all able to see my slide now? One of no, sir, no, sir. Huh? no, sir. No. So the next uh, topic uh, that I'm going to cover is this. I think now it is visible, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, OK, so. Yeah, mm. so here uh, we are going to talk about uh, something called uh, federated cloud. How many of you have heard about federated cloud? Federated cloud and privacy of cloud two topics I have combined together in the same set of slides. Uh, so privacy uh, in cloud computing is a very concerning issue and uh, and the other uh, thing is federation federated cloud that is basically uh, a feature which basically improves uh, the overall performance of the cloud uh, services, right? Uh, so we are going to talk about both. So we'll, I'll start with uh, federated cloud. How many of you have heard about federated cloud? Anybody who has heard about federated cloud? OK, so let me go ahead. Uh, even if you do not know, it is not a problem as usual. Um, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, cloud federation. So actually in cloud federation, what you are talking about is uh, several cloud, right? So so far what we talked about is that you have these cloud services which are offered by individual cloud service providers right so in cloud federation basically you have many such clouds uh, which are offered by their individual cloud service providers so they come and they join hands to offer uh, you know improved services uh, to the users um, you know so basically you know what happens is you have uh, these distributed uh, cloud services uh, which could be there uh, in a particular country or a couple of different uh, countries, etc., you have different geographically dis dispersed uh, cloud services, uh, cloud services and cloud service providers, and uh, there are uh, these these uh, dispersed ones. Uh, they are also heterogeneous, and they are autonomous systems. That means that they basically, typically, they do their own stuff. Uh, you know, so in terms of administration and uh, offering of uh, these uh, cloud services. Uh, but uh, what they can do is that uh, in a cloud federation, they can join hands, right? They can join hands through appropriate service level agreements. They can join hands and they can uh, enable the sharing of the resources uh, between these different uh, service providers. Uh, so uh, there will be certain, uh, you know, how, how and where or when these services are going to be shared it basically depends on the service level agreement and the contract that is signed. Uh, between these different uh, you know service providers right so there has to be some common objective based on this objective these cloud service providers they are going to have some kind of a contract wherein they join hands and offer improved levels of services so uh, so particularly if a particular cloud service provider doesn't have uh, you know adequate amount of resources it could be borrowed in a federated cloud environment these resources could be borrowed from another uh, uh, you know another uh, cloud uh, provider right uh, so this is basically an inter cloud kind of structure where multiple cloud service providers uh, they are basically brought under a single umbrella so this is the cloud federation is it clear to all of you okay so pictorially it looks like this so as i was telling you that you have csp1 that means cloud service provider one, two, three, and four, and then uh, you know all of them they could be you know interconnected based on certain policies, pre-agreed policies, and uh, you know so they will form this cloud federation, uh, like pictorially it is shown over here. This is the cloud federation. Now this cloud federation basically the advantage is that it looks like a big cloud. It's a mega cloud, right? So it's just to the user basically to the consumers. The consumer thinks that it's like a big cloud right 
but essentially you know it is basically large number of different types different uh, you know cloud service providers which may be offering different types of different infrastructure or services they basically join hands and it appears to the user that it's basically a mega cloud which they are going to use so these users or the consumers they connect to this mega cloud that means the federated cloud and they get their services by interacting with the cloud now the objectives of cloud federation is that uh, you know you can dynamically uh, expand the resources to fulfill consumer demand so assume that you know it is only csp1 and there is only one consumer uh, consumer one uh, who basically needs certain resources now let us say that the csp1 to which it requests the resources uh, so it doesn't have adequate resources so what it can do is that in a federated cloud uh, kind of scenario uh, you know it can request other nearby uh, csps like csp2 or csp3 and it can get access to these resources to fulfill the demands from the consumers right it's basically joining hands right it's like a joint venture kind of thing it's like a joint venture between different individual autonomous cloud service providers so basically the advantage is that you can lend the resources if you have ad, you know additional resources you can lend the resources uh, to uh, uh, you know um, you can lend the resources to the other cloud service providers who need it but everything is on a contract basis everything is on a payment basis and uh, so it's uh, it's like uh, you know what what uh, so let us say that whenever you are talking about uh, you know pools of uh, you know car right so car pooling for example right so there are several several uh, uh, you know service providers who could be brought under the umbrella and they could be uh, catering to the request so if some uh, service provider doesn't already have um, you know uh, uh, you know their their cars available they can request another service provider for it and so on so it's very similar to that and uh, it's uh, it's something which is uh, trending in the cloud computing uh, area of research okay so uh, so basically you know cloud federation requires integration of different types of cloud services in a single frame and uh, there is a requirement of provisioning uh, uh, of reliable and required quality of service fulfilled services um, uh, qs fulfilled services so reliable, reliability is important and requirement of fulfillment of uh, qs uh, services uh, is very important and uh, this basically uh, minimizes the chances of service level agreement violations right sla violation is a very important and serious thing in cloud computing basically you know so whenever uh, the user uh, requests certain services they should be able to get the services based on what has been the agreement uh, before right so but at the same time there could be some physical uh, you know uh, limitations as well if the cloud service provider has real physical limitation then what the cloud service provider can do is it can borrow certain resources from its neighboring cloud service providers and fulfill the requirements uh, without violating any service level agreements uh, with uh, the users there are several advantages of cloud federation uh, offering performance guarantees basically uh, you know resource lending helps to fulfill the demanded performance requirements of cloud service consumers then the second advantage is service level uh, service availability guarantee so basically you know because there is an integration uh, of these different cloud services there is a guarantee there is an increased guarantee of availability of cloud services uh, uh, and that is very important particularly you know whenever you are talking about disaster prone areas uh, you know so you know, whenever you have disasters you know it is quite likely that some services will be uh, not available so through this kind of inter cloud uh, kind of cloud federation uh, it is possible to offer uh, continued uh, services and making the services available throughout it is possible with the help of this kind of cloud inter cloud connectivity convenience cloud federation basically provides convenience and a unified view of services to the consumers uh, dynamic workload distribution cloud federation distributes the service demand of the consumers into geographically distributed data centers of different cloud service providers i hope that this part should be clear to you basically you know what happens is the overall workload is dynamically distributed to the different um, you know uh, to the different uh, devices or the different data centers and their corresponding devices it is distributed and all of them they collaborate they cooperate between each other and together they get uh, the work done that means the uh, you know the total workload is processed uh, through this kind of cooperation so um, cloud federation models 
there are different cloud federation models one is called the semantics based model the other one is called the market oriented model there is a reservoir uh, which is which was proposed proposed by uh, ibm and then you have the service layers or, uh, oriented federation right so um, you know so what i will do is uh, yeah, maybe let me start one or two of them and the rest of the things you know i can continue tomorrow and i will finish it off tomorrow uh, so uh, semantics based model basically you know it's a theoretical model where uh, semantics means meaning right so you know what is semantics so semantics and ontology they come together ontology means uh, you know representation so uh, this interoperability issue in cloud computing sorry in cloud federation uh, basically it can be handled with the help of this kind of uh, you know uh, semantics based uh, approach right so this uh, area of research which talks about uh, you know cloud federation uh, it uses semantics and the concept of ontology to integrate all the cloud and the uh, different cloud service providers together under the same umbrella uh, then you have the market oriented cloud federation model so here basically it's like a, you know it's like a trade uh, you know it's like a, a trading center where you have uh, you know uh, you have the actual clouds which are basically the which are offering the different services you have the application broker right because it is like a trading platform you have application broker uh, which is a middleware interface for communication between the consumers and the cloud service providers and then you have the cloud coordinator which is uh, which gives you a component that is located at each cloud in the federation and thereby together uh, to their coordination they maintain the integrity of the federation and there is something called uh, the idea of concentrator basically it is uh, like um, you know it, it 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 is like an entity which uh, acts as a market uh, of uh, the resources and the services so this concentrator basically takes these services that will have to be offered and the resources together into account and based on uh, these different requirements a mix and match kind of thing is done using certain su suitable algorithms and is offered uh, uh, you know the different cloud services are offered uh, to the end users so reservoir is another one uh, it was as i was telling you that it is a uh, project that was proposed by ibm it provides cloud federation framework to offer uh, software as a service to the cloud providers here it is not infrastructure but software as a service uh, through the reservoir framework uh, of ibm the objective of this framework is to help the isolated cloud service providers in overcoming the difficulties that are faced during the provisioning of the services to the consumers so there are uh, different uh, functional aspects that are provided by the reservoir uh, number one is the automatic and fast installation of different services and applications elasticity continuous optimization and independence of virtualization technologies these are the four different pillars uh, or the foundational uh, aspects of reservoir um, so uh, you know so again i am not going through all of these uh, just uh, to make sure that you know you are uh, uh, adequately um, you know exposed to these uh, terminologies and these concepts but uh, you know we do not have adequate time to go through each of them individually but if you are interested uh, and in fact i would encourage you to please uh, open the corresponding material from uh, uh, you know ibm and uh, please try to uh, understand uh, you know uh, better you know how there is the reservoir framework it works uh, so the service layers oriented cloud federation basically you know so it is talking about the integration of all these different services like infrastructure as a service platform as a service and software as a service so these are going to be treated as separate isolate layers in the overall integrated cloud federation model and it integrates not only the different heterogeneous resources but also the different types of services of the cloud right so this is the whole idea how you can integrate ias pas and sas under uh, as different layers under the same framework this is what the service uh, service layers oriented cloud federation model basically proposes um, so with this uh, i'm going to uh, stop over here today um, so uh, so quickly maybe you know we can take uh, uh, one or two questions if you have any questions from students i'm very sorry actually i had to rush you through because uh, you know i i didn't want to skip all of these i just wanted to make sure that you are aware of what is already existing um, and um, so by tomorrow i think you know i should be able to uh, finish uh, uh, most of the important stuff that I wanted to uh, do this semester. So please uh, come prepared for the test uh, uh, on Friday. Uh, that means day after tomorrow. And uh, all of you, um, uh, please also wrap up your project work uh, on uh, next Wednesday, coming Wednesday. Uh, basically, the projects are also going to be evaluated. 
okay so please connect with your individual ts so thank you very much i am going to bring it to an end because there is another uh, uh, you know one of the students phd viva which is there and i will have to uh, be there okay so thank you